Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am one of the educators here at Bywater Solutions. Today, we also have with us Adam, and he will be monitoring the chat and Q&A. So if you guys have questions, uh, please let us know. Today, we'll be covering the tools, reports, and administration um, enhancements for the 1611 upgrade. So I'm going to first start by just checking in with everyone. The upgrade schedule is up on the site. I'm sure most of you have already seen this, um, but we will have uh, this week and next week um, for additional sessions. Um, they will be recorded and made available on demand. And then at the end of those upgrade webinars, the week of April 10th, we will be having town hall sessions where we will cover um, specifics for academic, public, special and consortia libraries. Uh, so please feel free to join us at any one of those sessions. Um, it'll be interactive where we cover questions that we received from the upgrade and give you guys an opportunity to um, discuss some of the enhancements with other users um, in the Bywater community. Um, also on our website, which will be under the Koha Education and then Upgrade Notes, we have two different pages set up, one for the 1611 Upgrade Notes as well as one for the 1605 Upgrade Notes. Um, under the 1611 Upgrade Notes, we're going to have links to all of the recorded sessions, um, so those will be made available on demand. Um, so you can come in here and watch these at any time if you have other staff members who weren't able to attend the live sessions. Um, those will be available on demand. Um, they're also available on the Bywater Solutions uh, YouTube channel as well. Okay, so let's start in the tool section um, for today's session. So underneath our tools option, I'm gonna come over here and let's start under our patrons and circulation. Uh, one of the nice new enhancements is going to be under the batch patron deletion and anonymization um, tool. There has been a drop down menu added right up top where you can see where it says select library. Um, and this will allow you to come in here and select a library um, that you want to anonymize on. So for now, um, this functionality was limited um, uh, to all libraries and now you can come in and select by a specific branch. Um, so you have a nice option to allow you to select that. Our next enhancement is going to be um, in the patron modification tool. So again, under patrons and circulations, I'm going to scroll down to batch patron modification. And now we have a new option when we're performing a batch modification. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to jump in and let's select um, a specific uh, group of patrons. I'm going to select nursing home and now I'm going to come over here um, and I can see my list of patrons. This new enhancement will now allow me to batch modify an OPAC note. So now this will be one of the fields you can modify for multiple people. So for example, you can see here in my um, nursing home, maybe I wanted to add an update um, that says we do outreach there uh, the third Tuesday of every month. I could put that in the OPAC note um, and save that and then modify all of those patrons that are on the list. So just a nice way, um, this feature now adds the option for OPAC notes for one of the available fields to do your batch modification for. Okay, we have another exciting one um, in our patrons and circulations. So I'm going to come back to my tools feature. And this time we're going to come back over to our patron lists. Um, prior to this, anytime you wanted to delete a patron, um, if you wanted to do it one by one, you would have to log in to the patron's account um, on the staff side, pull up their account, and under the more drop down, um, you would have to select delete patron. Or if you wanted to come over and batch um, patron delete, you can follow the steps there. Now you can actually come in and delete patrons right from a patron list. 
So for example, I have some uh, a list entitled Girl Scouts. So if I wanted to come in here, you'll notice that I have an Actions drop-down menu. This drop-down menu gives you the option right at the bottom to batch delete patrons. Now if I select that, that's going to take me into my next screen, which will allow me to um, see what's in there. You can see it says I have four patrons that will be deleted. Um, and then I have three options down below. Permanently delete, move the patrons to trash, or do not remove them. So I could do a test run if I wanted to do that as well. So again, um, from my patron lists, over on my actions menu, I of course have a new option which is to batch delete um, patrons um, from a list. This is a, this is a huge enhancement. Um, you know, sometimes you just want to maybe delete 10 or 11 people. This allows you to go in um, and delete those one off. Jesse. Hi. Deb has a question. Okay. She wants to know how the list is generated and, and where she can generate that list. Oh, sure. Yep. Right up top here, um, you'll see there's a, a plus sign and that's the new patron list. So let's say I wanted to come in here um, and I can create a new list called delete patrons. Uh, once I save that in there, you'll notice up top that I have a patron search. So I can come in here, start, start typing in a patron's name, and then down below it'll show me that patron, and I can select add patrons. Now I can do quite a few at a time, so um, let's say I was adding in a few. So let's add in Joanne, let's add in um, Todd, and let's add in Nate. So I can come in here and add as many as I need and then hit add patrons and now they will be added to my delete patrons um, list. So now if I come back over to my patrons list, you can see there's my three original Girl Scouts, Nursing Home, and Todd's list and then you can see that um, delete patrons option right there. Great question. Okay. Now there's also another option um, that you have right from your patron list too. Um, and this is a new feature. For those of you that use the patron card creator, um, you can also have an option to print patron cards right from a patron list. Um, so now we have another option here and that says um, print patron cards. Um, so if I select that, that's going to bring a pop-up box for me that will allow me to select the template. And that template is coming from my patron card creator. Also my select a layout to be applied. And that again, that layout is going to pull from my, um, my card creator. And then I also have that starting card position. Again, that's going to look at my layout. So that allows me to export and print those off. So some nice options there when it comes to patron lists. We had quite a few um, tools um, that have been added in for your patrons. Okay, I'm gonna come back to my tools menu. And now we're gonna come over here to the um, right hand side. And under additional tools, we have a new feature that's been added into the news tool. Okay, so now in our news tool, prior to this, if we had something in the news section that we wanted to delete, we'd have to come over here to the left-hand side, select the items that we wanted to delete, and then down at the bottom, we would have delete selected. Well, now there's been a nice radio button that's been added over here under the actions column, and that's going to be the option to delete. So one of the nice features that I always really liked about um, Koha in the news is, of course you can set up an expiration date. So let's say you have um, an event going on at the library on Thursday night and you want it to expire. Um, this now will allow you to come in and instead of selecting multiple ones, you can just come over here to the right hand side and then now select this delete option. So I can go in there and just delete. Okay, we have one more um, new enhancement in the tools that I'd like to point out, and that's gonna be under the catalog section, and that is going to be the automatic item modification by age. 
Okay, this is going to take me into um, a new feature. Now this new tool um, will allow you to update item specific fields when they reach a certain age. So here you can see we've added a few new in. So I'm actually gonna come in here and edit those rules so you can see what this looks like. So a couple great examples for this one would be um, when we get new materials into the library. Um, you know, usually we'll put them up in the front, maybe in a special section um, for new books or new materials. Um, sometimes I've seen in um, a college libraries, they'll have a, um, a new courses by sections. Um, and that allows you to kind of display them for the students or your patrons to notice when they come in. Now, what this does is this allows you to, number one, select an age in days. And what that's going to be is after a certain condition is met, it will look at the age in days and then change it to a new um, item specific field. Now, the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to select a condition, and that's the criteria needed to trigger that update. So you can see here it's going to look at anything in the items table. So for this example, I selected the items.item type, and I'm going to come in here and say um, a new book. Now, my substitution is after it hits that 60 days, what do I want it to change to? So here you can see I again selected items dot item type and I've changed that now to book. So now it's going to change from item type of new back to an item type of book. Now I can also add a second or third rule in and what that will do is, for example, if I have an items location, um, maybe I have something called new materials. I can also add in a condition um, that's triggered to change to something else. So here I have items.location, and maybe I'm going to change that to stacks. So again, I will select my age and days. Now, once you've created these rules in the system, um, the next thing that you'll need to do is um, set up a corresponding cron job. Um, so if you're interested in using this feature, um, please submit a ticket and we can set up the cron job to run for this. Um, so this is um, this does need to have a cron job that's running it on the backside so we can absolutely set that up for you. Um, this is a nice feature. Um, I actually just had an academic library um, ask a question about this. They said, you know, sometimes they have things on display for about um, 30 days and uh, often um, they'll forget to change it back even though they know they're moving it back into the stacks. So this is a great way to kind of help you remember to do that. So that's a nice new feature there. Okay, I'm gonna jump back up to my tools. Um, now we do have um, two new system preferences for tools. So I'm gonna come in here to more and I'm gonna scroll down to administration and we're gonna come into our global system preferences. Um, so we have two um, and those are going to be our max item. So we have one for max items to display for batch deletion. So this will allow you to display up to a thousand items in a single item deletion batch. And then my other one is going to be max items to process for batch modification. And so that one's set to a thousand. The default is a thousand. If you want to change it to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, you can now come in and edit those um, system preferences. Now we had an individual ask in our last session, um, you know, if we do increase it to let's say 3,000 or 4,000, um, I can say that I, I have done about 3,000 at a time and the difference that I notice is it takes just a little bit longer to process a large batch like that. Um, the process will still work. You'll notice that it'll just take a little more time. Um, sometimes when I, you know, I've batch uh, modify, you know, item types or, um, or locations or whatever it may be. Sometimes I'll break them into chunks and I'll do a thousand at a time. However, you can increase this to um, a larger number to process those. Okay. Um, one more um, system preference that ties into um, our tools is one that's for our notices. Um, and now we have a option to have a claims um, blind carbon copy added um, to 
um, an email when you send out a serial or acquisitions claim notice. This is a really nice feature, especially if you're using the claims feature in either the serials um, or acquisitions module. So now what it'll do is it will actually send a BCC, you know, you have the option for send or don't send, um, that will allow you to um, send off um, a BCC in that email. So it's whatever the user is logged in when that claim goes out. So for example, if I'm logged in, I will get an email um, as a BCC for the claims issue that I've sent to the vendor, okay? So what it'll do is it will just look um, at that particular um, user that is logged in. So you've got a few new system preferences that tie in there. Okay, I'm gonna come back up to administration. Now we have another system preference that ties into functionality with our tools, and that's the option to add SMS messaging via email as an alternative to your SMS services. So prior to this release, you would have to send an use a third-party system in order to send out an SMS message. Well, now you can actually use email. So what the system will do is it will send an email to a cellular provider, and in exchange, that cellular provider will send an SMS message back to the end user. So let's talk about the preferences that you need to turn on in order to make this happen. The first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to enter email in the SMS driver. And what that's going to do is that's going to trigger the system letting them know that you're going to use this preference. So once you've entered email with a capital E, lowercase m-a-i-l, and save that system preference, you're going to have a new feature show up on the administration page. So if I scroll all the way down to SMS cellular providers, I will have a new option here under those additional parameters. So again, once I turn that system preference on for email, this will be triggered down below. So now when I select SMS cellular providers, I have the option to add these in. Now this will be empty once you turn it on. Um, so you can come in here and add in um, as many cellular providers that you have. Uh, we put the four basic ones in here as an example. We have Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon. And what that's going to do is um, that will show me at all times how many patrons that we have connected. So the way this is working again is this will send an email from the system to the mobile provider and then the mobile provider will send a text message back to the end user. Once you have this information set up, the next step for your staff will be to come into your patron's account. So for example, let's pull up a patron very quickly. I'm going to pull up um, Julian Slowburner here. And under our details menu, you'll notice that under um, patron messaging and preferences, I now have a option that says SMS number. Now if I edit that and come in, this will allow me to edit the SMS number and select the SMS provider. Now this does need to be entered in, um, in the advanced messaging preferences in order for this to work. Of course, you would also have to select the SMS message that you want to go out for the user. Now, a nice option that um, the user also has is that they can now do this from logging in on the OPAC. So if the user is logged into the OPAC on their account information, under the left-hand side where we have our tabs for your messaging, the user will now have an option to come in and add their SMS number along with select their SMS provider. So they can provide this information and then you can also add it in on the staff side as well. Once that information has been added into the system, it will follow the same parameters when it gets pushed out to the process message queue. 
So this allows you to now customize your messages that you can send out to your users. So if, you, if this is new to you when you're using SMS, you'll want to remember to come up to More and then select Tools. And then if you come down to Notices and Slips, you'll be able to go in and customize one for SMS messages. So let's say we're going to do one for Item Checkout. If I come over here to edit, you'll notice that I have four options. And if you weren't using SMS before, when you selected it, SMS was probably grayed out. Now that we've created the SMS option, I can actually come down here and start entering a specific message. Now remember with SMS, we are limited to 160 characters. The nice thing about this feature is you'll notice right up top here where it says message body, it tells me I have zero of 160 characters used. So this, when I start typing, will tell me how many characters I've actually used before I hit that 160. So now you can see I have 51 out of 160 characters used. Um, so this is just a nice option to turn that on. Okay, um, we've covered some of our tool enhancements. So now let's move on to some of our enhancements that have happened in reports. So I'm going to select the More drop-down menu and come down to Reports. Okay. Now within our reports module, we have a few new features. The first is going to be, there is a new report under statistics and that is called cash register. Jesse, we have a quick question on the SMS. Oh, sure, go ahead. Eric would like to know if you insert a parameter in the SMS message and it goes over 160 characters, what happens? it'll be cut off after those 160. Thank you. No problem. So in the cash register statistics, this report will allow you to run a report um, on a specific time period and you can take a look at specific transaction types. So for example, if I wanted to look at all transactions, or all payments to the library, or you can see several that have been added in, whether it's specific ones that I've had, um, payments, accruing fines, fines, or write-offs, I can come and select those. For now, I'm just gonna select all payments to the library. I can also specify by a specific branch, so this will be great if your users need to run something at the end of the day or the next morning. Once I'm done, I'm gonna come down to the bottom and hit submit. So here you can see for as of 327, today's report, I can see the manager's name, so that's gonna be the user um, that processed the payment. Then I can see the patron's information, their card number, the name, um, the transaction location, so the branch that it happened, um, the date, and the um, transaction payment type. I have a section for notes here. So any type of notes, um, this was paid via cash, uh, this was paid via check. Um, if you use the new PayPal feature, we would see a note that said um, payment made via PayPal. Then I can see the amount, and then my last three columns are going to cover the title information. So I can see the title of the book, the barcode, and the item type. So a nice new report that's been added in there. There's also been a few new filters that have been added into the circulation statistics wizard. So if I come down under statistics again and I select circulation, I have a few new fields that have been added in. I have the patron branch, um, issuing branch and item branch. So still the same report, I just have a few more options that have been added in here on the left hand side. The same thing goes for my cataloging statistics wizard. I still have my same report in here, except now I have a few more options. So under my cataloging wizards, down below I have an option for cell value. And this is a really nice feature that's been added in because now I can look at my count of total items, I can count the unique bibliotheques, 
or I can count deleted items. So when I'm running my catalog statistics report, I can select additional values down below. So some nice options that have been added in. Okay, I'm gonna jump back up to my reports module. We have a few more enhancements that have been added in. For those of you who use the most circulated items under top lists, we have a few new values that have been added in here, three of them. The first is call number. So I can add a specific call number. I can select a specific collection code. This is really nice. Uh, prior to this, you couldn't select collection or shelving location. So now I can come in here and select a specific collection code and or a shelving location from the list. So three new fields that have been added into that most circulated items. Okay, now we're going to look at another new report that has been added and that's going to be under your other options. You'll notice now that we have orders by fund and so I'm going to select that. Orders by fund is going to allow me to filter out any type of orders that I still have in the system. So you notice I have an option over here to show active or inactive. And then as I select from this drop down menu, I can select all funds, active funds, and then those are the funds that I currently have in the system. So for example, let's use museum books, one of my funds. Of course, down below, I can select how I want the output to come in. For now, I'm just going to select museum books. And now this is going to take me down to my um, orders for my particular fund for museum books. So here I can see the baskets it's associated with, the basket name. I can see the librarian who placed it. I have the title, of course, the list and replacement price, the budgeted cost, the quantity that was ordered, and then I can see the total, as well as any type of um, dates associated with this particular um, order. I'll also be able to see any type of internal note. You can see an example down here added to faculty collection, as well as vendor note that's attributed, attributed to that particular order. So a nice option that's been added in there, just a quick report. Okay, now that we talked about some of our new reports and in, um, some options that have been added to those reports, let's go into our saved library. And we have a couple new um, enhancements that have been added here. Um, the first is going to be over here under um, our saved results column. So there is actually a new column that's been added in um, called save reports. What this does is if you have a report that's scheduled, um, and those are reports that we can schedule um, in the um, on the backside at Bywater, we can schedule a report to go out um, daily, weekly, monthly. What this allows you to do is actually add a new script to the runreport.pl cron job. And what that is is called store results. What this will do is this will serialize into uh, JSON and the results will be put on the saved reports table. So here you can see it'll show up and there will be a link um, for those in there. So if there's a report that you have that runs on a, um, on a regular basis, whether it's weekly or um, monthly, daily, whatever it may be, you now have the option um, to have a populated date uh, with a link that when you click on that link, it will take you to that data um, in the table. So a nice new enhancement there. Again, if you have something scheduled, please just submit a ticket and then we can add uh, that new script if you'd like to store those results um, in the saved reports list. Now, as we take a look at the um, saved reports, you'll notice that we have um, this great new enhancement over on the last column, and that is our actions item. And you'll notice that the actions item um, now has um, the run button 
uh, directly there. So prior to this release, we'd have to select that up button and then come in here and select run. Now I can actually select run right from the saved reports table and that will run my report. So again, that'll take me into my parameter so I can run that report. So a nice option so you don't have to hit that drop down menu anymore. Now this takes us into another new enhancement. Um, so prior to this, um, your results would display um, right on the screen and then down below you'd have the option to download it. Um, with three different options. Now that download report is now in the reports toolbar. So if you look all the way over here on the right hand side, you'll notice that I now have the option to download um, in three different ways, of course, just as I did before. So prior to this release, again, it was down here on the bottom, and now we have it up top. So you can download right from that toolbar. Okay, one more enhancement that's on that toolbar. Um, you'll notice that we now have a delete button. So I can actually delete a report right from the screen. Prior to this, that delete button was on the saved reports menu. And now you can see there's a delete button that's right on that reports toolbar. So that again, um, a few new enhancements to the reports toolbar. Um, things have been moved around just a little bit differently. You'll notice that in the 1605 and 1611 um, upgrade, we've had a lot of things that have changed to actions buttons. Um, so here you can see we have that example where we have our download, which allows me to select from that. If I come back to my saved reports, um, we now have this reports button. So a lot of things look a lot um, sleeker um, in the system and kind of as we move on to a few more enhancements on the admin side, you'll see it there as well. Okay, now we have one more enhancement that's with our um, scheduling reports feature. Again, now the scheduling reports feature is not over here. Um, some of you um, know that this um, scheduling option right here, that currently does not uh, work in the system. That sends just one off. However, if you have reports that are scheduled to run um, through Bywater and that cron job, um, when that scheduled report runs, um, it comes to you via email and it's sent in the body of the email. Okay, there's a new enhancement that now the report comes as an attachment, um, allowing the data to be manipulated or added to. So again, that's a really nice enhancement and that was a um, paid development by one of our partners, uh, Briarcliff University. So now when you get any of those reports that are scheduled in your system, um, when you get that email, um, it will now come as an attachment. Um, prior to this, it would come in the body of the email. So a nice new enhancement there as well. Okay. All right, so now that we've covered some of the reports enhancements, um, let's talk about some new staff permissions. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to pull up um, one of our staff accounts. So now you have a few new staff permissions that have been added. So I'm going to come over here to more and then I'm going to scroll down to set permissions. Now here we have Joan has super librarian permissions. But if I unselect that, let's take a look at some of the new ones. The first are going to be under tools. If I scroll down a little bit, at the end of my tools, I have a new option. And there are going to be three new um, staff permissions under tools. The first is to upload general files. So this allows um, staff to upload files into the system. The second is going to be upload local cover images. So this would give them the permission to upload local cover images through that edit dropdown um, in cataloging or down in the holding table through that tab where they can upload local cover images. So now you have those two new permissions. Then my final third new permission here under tools is going to be upload manage and that allows you to manage upload files, okay? So we have a few new ones. Okay, 
Now, we have one more that's been added into a staff permission, and that's going to be under our reports feature. So in the staff um, permissions, you now have a new option, and that's going to be to delete SQL reports. Okay, so you can see here we have create reports, so you can give them the option to create SQL reports, delete SQL reports, or execute SQL reports. So you have some new permissions that have been added in here. Okay, so this will be a nice transition. I'm going to move us right into some of our administration new enhancements and changes. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is under our MARC bibliographic frameworks. You'll notice that there's lots of new nice action buttons. I really like this. Prior to this, you can remember in earlier releases, you would have a link in one column that said MARC structure, then you'd have a link in another column that said export, and then a link in another option that said import. You'll notice in 16.11, we have a, a lot of these new action buttons and drop-down menus, making it look a lot sleeker for the individual to choose what they're looking for. So let's take a look. I'm going to come over here and select Mark Structure. That takes me into my um, table. Now you'll notice now I also have action buttons over here, which again take me right into my subfields, um, the option to edit or delete a particular um, subfield. So again, just some nice new action buttons that have been added. Okay, now let's talk about some of the new system preferences that have been added into the system. So the first one is you now have options to choose different XSLTs for list. Now this is a paid development that came from Carnegie Stout Public Library. So we have two new system preferences. So let's take a look. So now we have a new one for XSLT list display. Um, so this allows um, the users to set custom XSLTs for list displays. So for example, if you want to add um, additional um, mark fields, you can specify those. The other system preference is OPAC XSLT list display. And if I scroll down a little bit farther here, you can see we have the OPAC XSLT um, list display. So if it's left empty, um, there will be no XLT um, default. We'll default to the um, default one in the system. And then if you have a um, customized one, you can um, link out to that. If this is something, again, that you need help with setting up, please just let us know and we will help you set that up. Okay, let's come back and look at a few more system preferences. For those of you that are using the patron self-registration, there's been a few more that have been added in. The first one is under the system preference for patron self-registration. If I have it set to allow, in prior releases, all you would see here is library patrons to register or modify their account via OPAC. Now, sometimes, uh, users would get a little confused. So there's been a new note that's been added to this release. So it just lets you know that that needs to have the patron self-registration default category, which is another system preference, to be set to the valid patron category. So if we scroll down, you can see here in our test system for the patron self-registration ca default category, I have that self uh, listed in there. Now we have a new system preference, and that's going to be patron self-registration, email must be unique. So you have two options here, consider and don't consider. So if I have it set to consider, it will look at the patron's email to make sure it's unique when self-registering. So if it is, an email won't be accepted if it's already existed in the database. So again, you can select don't consider or consider. Don't consider will be the default. 
The next new system preference added is the patron self-registration library list. And this is really nice if you have a multi-branch system and some branches would like to use the feature and some won't. So if it's left empty, all libraries um, will have the option available. However, if you want to um, leave out a few branches, you can come in here and enter the branch code with, of course, a pipe delimiter to separate. Um, and then those particular branches, um, the other branches not listed will be left out. So a nice option if you do have a multi-branch or campus system. Finally, the last one we have here is the patron self-registration pre-fill form. So this is a new system preference which allows you to specify if you want to display and pre-fill the password and login um, form after the patron is self-registered. So that's the default. Of course, you could come in and select do not display and pre-fill um, the password after login. So you have a few new um, preferences there. Okay. Another system preference, um, for those of you who subscribe to Novlist, um, there's a new system preference that has been added in. Um, the first is going to be Novlist um, Select Staff, um, which allows you to enable it on the staff side. And then you also have the staff view. So this allows you to see it on the staff side. So in prior releases, you would only be able to see the Novlist on the OPAC side. Now I can come over here to Novlist um, Select Staff Enabled and change that to Add. So let's take a look as to what that would look like um, in the system. So let's pull up a quick um, title. Once I search for the title in the system, I'll have my list of results. Um, once that list of results comes up, I'll be able to go into that item's detailed um, view of the record. Now, once I get into that detailed view of the record, I'll be able to go down to that holdings table. And you'll notice that now I'll actually have a new tab that's visible on my holdings tab. So if I look all the way down here to the right hand side, I now have a tab for nov list select. So now I can actually see that on the staff side. This is a great new enhancement, um, you know, for as long as I can remember, it's just been on the OPAC. So, you know, if you're sitting um, at the reference desk and you like to start on the staff side, you know, you'd have to have, um, of course, the OPAC open to look at Novelist Select over here. Now you can do it right from um, the staff side. So some really nice options there. Okay, so now let's talk about some other new system preferences that have been added in that we didn't cover. Um, for those of you that have been in our um, earlier sessions, we talked about the addition of PayPal in the system. Um, so now users can actually um, pay via PayPal in the system. And what this allows you to do is set up um, a PayPal account to uh, receive payment through the OPAC. Um, so now if I come over here, you'll notice when I select your fines in the OPAC, I have an option for PayPal down below. So again, this is something that you can turn on and off, um, which allows the user to pay via PayPal. So we have several new system preferences here. Now the first one is to allow or don't allow patrons to make payments from the OPAC uh, via PayPal. Now you have two options here. You have in sandbox mode and production mode. So what this allows you to do is actually come in and practice and see what it would look like prior to um, testing it on your production server. So if those of you are interested, I'm gonna put a link um, to the manual um, that includes the um, PayPal sandbox mode values. So if you're interested in, in trying that and setting it up, um, that information is there. Um, we also have a great video on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, Kyle Hall, who's our lead developer, um, created a great video that actually walks you through setting up PayPal in the system. So some of our other system preferences here um, would allow you to see the um, where the patron would see the charge so I can specify what it will look like for the patron. So you can specify your library name and then that fee payment. And then the rest of the information would be your PayCal, 
PayPal account information, um, both your password, signature, and email address. So once you have that set up in the system, you'll be able to receive um, PayPal payments. Um, now quickly, while well, we're talking about this. Um, a few of you have asked um, in prior sessions uh, where this will be visible on the staff side. Um, so in the patron's account, you'll actually be able to see in the notes column if it was paid via PayPal. Um, so you will be able to see it there. Okay, let's come back to some of our new, um, some of our other new um, system preferences. You can also have the option to authenticate um, using Google. What this allows you to do is to set up um, Google Open ID so you can connect, your users can connect um, using their Google um, information. For those of you who are interested in setting it up, I'm gonna paste another URL um, in the chat box, um, and there's actually very detailed information that walks you through screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions. I'm also gonna pull that up over here. Um, that will walk you through setting it up in the system. We actually have screenshots in here of the Google APIs, um, setting it up, which system preferences to fill in, and walking through that. Um, so this is a nice way that um, now your users um, can authenticate um, using a Google ID. So you'll notice we have four new system preferences here, um, and that's gonna include your client ID, your client secret, as well as your information if you're connecting to um, or restricting to a domain or a subdomain. So for those of you maybe at a community college or an academic library, if you wanted to restrict to just your, um, you know, your students, your faculty, your staff, you can absolutely restrict at that level as well. Okay, a few more um, important system preferences that have been added in. We have our article requests. Our article requests are going to tie into um, some of our options in our circulation and fine rules, which we'll get into in just a minute. Our article requests allow us to enable or don't enable patrons to place article requests through the OPAC. What this allows them to do is make a request at the record level, the item level, or I can select both, which would allow the student or user or patron to go into the OPAC and make a request via the OPAC. So it works just like Holdswell. That allows them to come in, fill out a form, and submit that article. For those of you who have been on um, earlier sessions, um, we provided a, a breakdown of that. For those of you who may have missed some of those earlier sessions, let me show you what that looks like. So if I come over here to the OPAC, and let's say I wanted to request a specific article here from my Consumer Reports Buying Guide, this will take me in and you'll notice that now I have a specific link here that takes me in to request an article. This allows the student to come in here and specify um, what type of information needs to be filled out in the form so they can come down and place that request. Now you'll notice we have a few more um, system preferences that have been added in. This allows you to select which fields are mandatory if it's at the record or item level, if it's just at the item level, or if it's just at the record level. So you have some flexibility there. Okay. Now that we've covered some of our system preference, I'm going to jump over to administration. Let's wrap things up by talking about some of our new circulation and fine rules. We have a few more columns that have been added to our circulation and fine rules. Okay, as I scroll over just a little bit, our first one is going to be cap fine at replacement price. So now I have a checkbox here that will allow me to cap the fine at the replacement price. Um, 
This will prevent the patron's fines from going above the replacement price of the item. So for example, um, let's say um, I selected it and here I have my overdue fines at $25. Let's say I have a DVD and that gets um, a fine of $1 a day. And um, at day 28, essentially my overdue fines um, you know, would be $28. Well, I have the option to cap that at the replacement price. So for example, if the replacement price was maybe $21, I can cap it at that $21. So this cap at replacement price will prevent the patron's fines from going above the replacement price on that particular item. I'm gonna scroll a little bit over. We have a new column that's been added in, and that is holds per record. This allows now for functionality to place multiple holds on a record or item level. Uh, this is a huge enhancement. Um, so prior to this, a user could only place one hold per record. Now the users can come in and have it specified, um, so staff can specify by the patron category and item type how many holds can be placed per record. Um, this is especially great for um, records that may have um, a multi-volume set attached, so if you have multiple volumes attached to that record, um, or for some uh, libraries that when you're cataloging maybe um, multi-season sets, so for example, let's use Lost, um, you know, we have five or six seasons, and maybe you have disc one, season one, disc two, season two, disc three, season three, they can go on and place um, multiple holds per record. Now again, this is controlled by the patron category and item type, so you can specify it for each patron category and item type. Now the default will be one, but of course you can go in and edit that. Now my last one over here that's been added into my circ and find rules is going to be my article requests. So this is where I can come in and um, I have the option to select uh, yes, which would allow the user to request at both the um, record and item level. Um, I could select record only or item only or of course no, which would mean that the request article option would not be available um, for that user. So a couple new uh, fields that have been added in there. Okay, so um, we've made it to almost about an hour here, um, and I'd like to um, leave some time for users to ask any questions. Um, do you guys have any questions that I can answer about some of the uh, tools or reports, system preferences? Okay. Um, okay, okay, great. Um, while we're waiting for questions, if you guys have any, I'm just gonna um, quickly bring up our, our YouTube channel here. So if you just come into Bywater um, Solutions, you'll be able to see, there's our logo, um, all of our videos that have been added in. Um, now we've been adding in our videos um, as soon as we do our webinars, so you could see the public um, and OPAC user webinar is already up, as well as technical services, and our two hours, what's new. But there's also some great videos up here um, for those of you interested in setting up PayPal. Um, there's a PayPal uh, payments in Koha that Kyle did that walks you through that, as well as those multi-item holds in Koha, so setting your system preferences up and CERC rules to make that happen. Uh, so please come and take a look at these. And remember, um, 
to look at all of the new system preferences uh, for each one of our upgrades. If you come into Koha Education and Upgrade Notes, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll be able to see all of the new system preferences for each one of the releases. The same thing goes for 1605. If I scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, you'll be able to see all of those new system preferences that link out to, um, out to the manual. Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, I encourage you to uh, let your staff know they can join us. Um, again, we have um, this week and next week, uh, we have more sessions going on. We're doing two a day. Um, please feel free to attend. We will be recording those and make them available on demand. And then don't forget to join us uh, the week of April 10th when we have town hall specific to each one of our um, libraries. Uh, for our Bywater partners. And this will be an interactive session where you can ask questions um, and be able to interact with um, the Bywater staff to ask questions as well as other partners. Okay, thank you everyone. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you, Adam, very much for um, looking at the uh, Q&A in the chat and helping it uh, with the communication. Oh, my pleasure.